I am Shweta. I have over 16 years of experience in IT and software. So my name is Jeff Burke. I'm a senior cloud solutions architect at Sunari. My name is Alistair. I am a contract senior DevOps and platform engineer working for the UK government. I'm one of the in-house trainers for Code Cloud, and we're here to talk about why DevOps and cloud go together, why they go together like peanut butter and chocolate. So if you're here, you have an interest in cloud computing and you have an interest in DevOps, and you might be interested in why I'm talking about this in 2023 when there's so many other things that we could talk about. So let's dive in. So, by the way, I will take questions during the entire time. If I see your question, I will answer it if I can. If it's I, maybe something I might defer towards the Q&A section, which we will leave probably about somewhere between 10 and 15 minutes at the end for questions. I am, by the way, focused primarily on cloud computing, DevOps, and I just actually left AWS as one of their certification writers and trainers. So feel free to ask me any questions about those topics as we get further in. So let's dive in. Okay. So imagine the year is 2005. Okay. So it's 20 years ago, but it's a minute, right? It's like almost two decades and there's no cloud. There's no DevOps. There's no Ansible, there's no Docker, there's no Terraform, there's no Kubernetes, there's no platform engineering, and you're really just a systems administrator. Because that's that was really, oddly enough, the job. The first dot-com bubble had come and gone, and so here we are a couple of years afterwards, and we don't realize, I think, sometimes the progress that we've made. And so I was a systems administrator working at the time, I think for AT&T, if I remember correctly, and... I got to tell you, compared to now, it felt like we were doing things the hard way, just to say this. Because fast forward a couple of years, and we've got DevOps. And what happened is that these two gentlemen at this Velocity conference in Santa Clara, California, Allspall and Hammond gave a talk that basically summarized like 11 deploys a day in production by Flickr, how developers and operations work together. And this sparked a whole movement, Patrick Duvall. Du Bois had a title for it. And the next thing, people are talking about how to get operations and how to get developers to talk together. Now, in 2009, at that point, I think I was working more as like a technical architect and a hands-on operations engineer. This was mind-blowing because I was like, you want me to go talk to the developers? I think they hate me, actually. And when they go over to the developers and the developers are like, we don't hate you. You just don't understand code. And I was like, well, you guys might understand code, but I'm not sure that you understand how operations functions. And we were just like cats and dogs. So this concept of getting us together was introduced back then. But just to be clear, even though cloud launched in 2006, cloud was not really a thing because it had not yet matured to the level that it did in 2011. In 2011, Microsoft and Amazon and Google all realized, and even IBM and some others all realized that the way in which we were running data centers was really hard. I can't tell you how many times I was crawling underneath the data center floor and I wasn't even the network administrator running network cables for my servers or running storage cables for my servers in the data center so I could provision a server to give to a development team so that they could test the proof of concept. So when cloud came on the scene and then finally hit maturity in 2011, DevOps was already two years old. But when it hit its stride, it was like, wait, I can put a credit card down and get infrastructure in minutes? And then later on, it was like, I can get it secure. I can get it compliant. I can get it so it can auto scale. I can get it to do all these things. We, it was absolutely mind-blowing in 2011. And then you were basically a cloud engineer at that point. You weren't basically a systems engineer. You were learning about all the ins and outs about how cloud function, the basic components of cloud and what was important about cloud. And what's funny is that older technologies, they might've shrunk a little bit, but you, they didn't go away. In other words, you were, added, you were adding more knowledge and more skills to already existing challenges. So then we fast forward and then you get this bevy of tools that come out. So then we've got Ansible, it comes out in 2012 and Chef and Puppet was already there. 
And then, you know, Docker is finally released. So containerization is made easier. I do want to point out that in 2013, even though that's when Docker was released, Sun Microsystems had containers back in like the mid 2000s and BSD jails, which were basically containers were available, I believe in the late nineties, if I remember correctly, because I think that's when I was messing with them. But Docker came out and Docker made it easy for us to do containerization. And then in 2014, we got a double whammy because cloud was out, Terraform, HashiCorp releases Terraform, which is like this multi-cloud, multi-platform tool that you can use to manage and provision your infrastructure, right? And then Kubernetes that comes out because Google's like, hey, let's publish an API-driven way of managing all these containers. And then last but not least, we got platforms. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to string all these like CI, CD pipelines and all these ways together so that developers can just deploy. And so you're evolving from being a container orchestrator to a platform engineer. But what's interesting about all this is that you find in IT that things go in cycles where it's like, oh, we got this new thing and then we're coming back around and now this whole thing. It's like centralization, decentralization. We're going to go into cloud and then we're going to host our own servers. And it just goes in these interesting like circular relationships. And so here in 2023, we ask ourselves, but what about the basics? This all started with DevOps and with cloud, and we've gotten tools that have been added on to make those things easier. But at the end of the day, we're actually using these tools really to just be able to ease our ability to deploy applications. And so the questions that we're asking is, what about the basics? How have we mastered DevOps? Have we, in a sense, mastered our ability to deliver in clouds? And then what happens if you put them together? And so this is where the idea came along. Of, let's talk about the peanut butter and the chocolate of DevOps in cloud, because this is where it really all started. This is where the, the conversation around accelerating app delivery, application delivery to production, like removing all the barriers that prevent us from delivering compliant, like secure quality software rapidly to production, this is where this all started, is it started with this DevOps movement and then cloud enabled it. So in other words, like, how do we talk about creating a cloud-centric DevOps and how they enable each other? So as I said before, I'm Michael Forrester. I've been around since 1996 in technology. I have worked for a sickeningly large number of people, including AWS, which I just left, ThoughtWorks, Red Hat, worked as a variety of different specialities, right? And so What's interesting here is that I feel like I've held a lot of roles and I still hold a lot of roles everywhere from individual contributors, the engineers of the world, all the way up to VP and director, and then all the way down and laterally and sideways as well. So I'll be the one doing the presentation tonight, today, and you can get, you can reach me at CloudCloud, just michael at codecloud.com if you ever want to email me. And I'm frequently on the Slack channels and the external Slack, so you can also catch me there as well. So let's dive into this question or this concept of, okay, what is a cloud-centric DevOps model? So first, let's just do a little refresher about what DevOps is and what cloud is. So if you get 20 engineers in a room and say, hey, I want you to define DevOps, you typically get about 25 different definitions because DevOps is, is ended up being evolved into this kind of catch-all for a lot of different concepts. But the bottom line is this, is that it is a practice followed by IT shops and businesses, right? Basically to create a culture around software delivery. And the reason that this it, it is framed the way it is, is that DevOps is a thought process that says, you know what, let's change our culture. Let's change our, through that, change our people. Let's change some processes. Let's change some technologies and make sure that we are removing any barriers that block us from delivering quality software at a rapid pace. That's really it. At its simplest terms, DevOps is about how you remove any barriers that prevent the teams that are responsible for it from delivering compliant software at a rapid pace. So, you know, things like infrastructure code, like reusing infrastructure code so you can get reuse and recycle, automating infrastructure because machines will go typically more consistent and faster than we will. So removing that human kind of toil element of the whole equation, making sure that we're following very clean and invested patterns around continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous delivery, 
And then automating those really well-known delivery patterns so that once again, we're removing human error and human element out of it and allowing this pipeline to reduce the friction of delivering software. Now you might say, Michael, what does that mean reducing friction? Like for example, take Uber, for example. Did anyone even know that they had a problem with taxis until Uber came along? The main thing that Uber does that's different from taxis is that it just makes it super easy for you to get into a car with a stranger, <laughs> right? Get a car and go from destination A to B, right? And what is hopefully like a safe way, but also in a known way, it's tracked, all the payments easy. It's just, it just makes it so easy to just get into a car and go with somebody else and drive out, right? And so who knew that we had a problem with taxis until Uber came along? And in a way, any application or any product that solves a problem for a customer in a way that makes it super easy to do like it solves the problem easily and at a very good like value, obviously, because you don't want to pay a million dollars for that. That product always wins. And that's DevOps's perspective on software delivery is how do we make it the easiest way possible to deliver software? And so the main advantage of DevOps is just the relentless focus on how do we reduce toil? How do we remove the human element? How do we reuse, recycle? How do we get automation in place? And then that comes back to we want feedback loops because we want to continuously improve. We want to continuously work on the problem areas in our processes until all of that waste is just slowly taken out of the whole equation. And so this is a huge advantage to DevOps because DevOps, since it's relentlessly focused on that, eventually you'll achieve it, right? Anything you focus on, you will get. You could argue, by the way, that focus is the most important like resource that we have now because doesn't every company want your attention, want your time, want your focus? So that's what DevOps is really focused on. So DevOps is basically the removal of anything that prevents a team from delivering compliant software at a rapid pace. That's the very, like definition of DevOps. Easiest one that I've heard. Now, how does DevOps work? Like, how does it do that? So I mentioned some of the things like build automation, following continuous integration, infrastructure as code, but like even things like configuration management. Consider yourself, like you're probably sitting in front of a laptop of some type, probably a MacBook, maybe an Intel-based Windows system, maybe Linux. So, you know, <laughs> cool if that's the case, right? And imagine how long did it actually take for you to set up your entire system? Now, a buddy of mine, we're talking the other day and we're like, I think I'm going to write something. I was like, I think we're really going to write something in Rust. We're like, we're going to write something where we automate the entire provisioning of our system. And we looked at each other for two seconds and we were like, oh, you mean configuration management, like the way Ansible does configuration management? And we kind of laughed at each other because we we're like, oh, we were really going to rewrite Ansible in order to just like configure our home systems. And I think what though, what that points out is that we don't even realize how much time we spend in configuring systems, setting up systems, correcting systems, make sure they have the right software versions, updating systems, right? And that's just the configuration management, arguably patch management portion of like common DevOps methods and practices. So when you see this list, it's like, oh, there's quite a number of interesting things here. And they're all focused on one thing. How do we remove the barriers that prevent us from delivering software, compliant software, secure software at a rapid pace, right? And then how do we respond, by the way, once that software is out? If it fails, like how do we keep it up and up and engaged for the customer? That's where the mo the monitoring and the troubleshooting pieces come in. So these are some of the common DevOps practices that are applied. There are a whole lot more, including general concepts like culture, automation, metrics, and of course, sharing and collaboration. So that's just a refresher about how DevOps functions. And one other point to make here is that DevOps is very keen on making sure that everybody required to take a piece of software from a software repository, like an idea, to code, to delivery, that is one team, if possible. Because when you get a team together that has all, everything, all the skills necessary to take something, an application through its entire life cycle, you've got a team that is fully empowered with no barriers to deliver, create, deploy, monitor, troubleshoot, all of the things necessary for that service or application. So all the skills needed are working together on that same team.
which is incredibly important from a DevOps perspective. Okay. Just checking to make sure. Let's see if there's any questions thus far. Looks like we're good. Questions are answered. Slack community got hooked in. That's excellent. Awesome. Okay, so this, in a sense, is our chocolate, right? So DevOps is that whole thing that re removes any barriers that deliver great software. This is, in essence, our chocolate. And while we covered a bunch of technologies and some concepts related, it's what does this alone get you, which we're going to talk about here in a few slides. What does just doing DevOps alone get you? We know it gets you great benefits because otherwise it wouldn't be so popular when we talk about it. Can we quantify that? And we will actually in just a second. But first, let's talk about cloud. Okay. <laughs> I'll never forget, by the way, in 2011, which is just so happens to be like the year that people say that cloud hit its like tipping point as far as adoption and maturity. I remember a buddy of mine called me up. He was the CTO actually. And he said, hey, for reasons unrelated to my personality, which I thought was funny that he said that, he said, my entire IT staff in this small startup just walked out the door. And I was like, Garrett, <clears throat> are you sure it wasn't related to your personality? Anyway, he was, an, he was a, an agreeable person, so it would be unusual that this would be the case. But he said, everybody just walked out. He said, I need you to come over and manage these virtual machines that are out in AWS. And I knew a lot about VMware, and I had been tracking cloud, but I didn't really know like the ins and outs of cloud. I thought cloud was just someone else's data center. I thought that someone had just put a slick interface around their VMware cluster and that it was like managing a VMware cluster, but a little bit more abstracted. This is 2011. Of course, I get in there and I, I could never be more wrong because I have to say that once I got into cloud in 2011, I never looked back because I realized that I was never going to have to crawl underneath the data center floor again if I stayed with cloud. And while it wasn't necessarily like the worst experience in the world, I realized that I was never going to be able to fully automate anything unless I was running infrastructure in cloud. Let me say that again in case you missed this. I realized as an engineer that I was never going to be able to fully automate the provisioning, the configuration, the recovery, the migration, all of the stuff related to virtual machines. I was never going to be able to fully automate them unless I stayed in the cloud because somebody else was responsible for running the cables and all that. And they were so far ahead of me that if I stayed in cloud computing, I didn't have to worry about getting inside of a data center and I could automate things to my heart's content. And in 2011, that's when I was like, oh, this cloud thing is going to be an absolute game changer once people realize they can finally fully automate everything they've ever wanted to do and they can let somebody else handle all the painful hardware stuff, like the hardware boundaries. Like I ran out of server space. I don't have enough networking ports. I don't have enough storage. All, the, all of a sudden, AWS and Google and Microsoft are handling all that for you. And now you are no longer having to deal with a loss of capacity because they're way ahead of you on that. So this was gold to me, right? Very gold to me. So then that leads us, okay, then what is cloud, Michael? If cloud isn't your hallucination about it being a VMware cluster, it's not your hallucination about just being virtual machines on some other platform, what is cloud actually? Now, the official definition is that cloud is the on-demand delivery of IT resources over the internet with basically on-demand pay-as-you-go pricing, which is a mouthful, right? But basically it goes like this, credit card, some identity information, open an account, and then get access to 300 plus services at whatever level you want within minutes, and you pay for what you use. That's it. So for example, if I go into to AWS and I make an API call, which by the way, can either be done through the web interface because there's a great management console for AWS as an example. There's also a command line interface that makes API calls. There's also Python and Rust and all the other languages that all make API calls. And they basically programmatically make these little calls, these little client side requests into AWS's endpoint infrastructure. And they and you say, hey, AWS, I'd like a two processor, four gigabyte memory machine. I want a virtual machine and I want it to run Ubuntu or I want it to run RHEL or I want it to run Windows server, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you just make that request and then it sends back a thing and says, hey, I'm spinning up a server for you. I'll let you know when it's done. That's it. And if you want a thousand servers, you can do that. You want a million servers? <laughs> you might get pretty close to that. 
like even AWS has hardware boundaries, by the way. And by the way, if you let them know ahead of time, if you call Azure and say, hey, we're going to put a million servers on your platform, be surprised if they, how much they would provision for you. So cloud is now 17 years old, but it's basically just an API API based way of getting access to all of the common software and services that we all use. You want a MongoDB compatible database? Guess what? They probably have one. You're looking for, you want to deploy, for example, most open source technologies like Elasticsearch. AWS has an analog called open search, right? You want to deploy a messaging bus like SQS or even ActiveMQ or RabbitMQ. Guess what? We can do that. And so it's, it abstracts away all of the basically low level data center access that you had before. So there's no more focus on data centers. So that's one of the advantages of cloud is that there's no more focus on data centers because the data centers are owned by AWS. You don't even know where they're at most of the time. You don't get access to them. You can't see them. And you don't really, you're not really worried about that. And then you're no longer investing in hardware, which is going to deprecate over time. But of course, now you're paying for a subscription, basically a monthly service. I wouldn't say a subscription. Let's say an on-demand service. Subscription is probably a misnomer. And you're using that basically now. So your spend is variable, but you can control it, right? But I will tell you that cost optimization in AWS can be tricky, especially as you get more complex, but you can do it, right? It just requires you to keep an eye on things. Now, by the way, one of the other advantages of using cloud is that now you can guess capacity with little to no risk. So for example, <laughs> you'll like this. How many of you have been in front of a vendor and they're like, so how big of a hardware box should I use for this? Like how big of a server? If I want to run 50,000 people concurrently on my platform, how big does my server have to be? And the vendor's like, we don't know. We, we have no idea. <laughs> We've done it with a thousand users. We haven't done it with 50. And so what happens is that you end up making these guesses as an engineer and an architect as to what you actually need. Here's the cool thing about using cloud is that you can now make that guess. And if your guess is wrong, then you give back the servers you're not using. And if you need more servers, because you're like, wait, what? You want me, I need 10 servers? I thought you said I only needed two. And you're like, we need eight more. Guess what? Put eight more back on there. And guess what? You now have the capacity you need so you can run that 50,000 concurrent users. So now, by the way, you can guess capacity with little to no risk because you can give back the boxes if you don't need them or if you're using containers or if you're using serverless, you can do the same thing. Now, here's the other cool thing about cloud is that you can now focus on what's core to your business. I cannot tell you how many times I'm like in an insurance company. I'm not going to name any names, but like I was just talking to an insurance company the other day and they're like, yeah, we run like seven data centers globally across the entire world. And I was like, how's that going? And it's like another, like a cost center for us and we're not really happy with it. And it takes weeks for us to get a server and we'd really like to move everything to cloud. And I was like, Maybe not everything to cloud, but let's talk about what you can move to cloud, what makes sense. But the insurance company wants to focus on selling insurance. They don't want to focus on running a data center. And that makes sense because you heard me just to say a few minutes ago that focus is probably the most important commodity you have. Where you put your focus and what you do with that focus and your time is, is like arguably the thing that will determine your destiny. That's a big statement. Well, here's the cool thing. That's what happens for companies as well. What a company focuses on determines that company's destiny. And if they're spending 20% of their resources focusing on running data centers instead of coming up with a new insurance product or a new way for their customers to file claim or a new way to reduce all the friction in filing claims, then honestly, they could be focusing on the wrong things. And you're like, but don't you need a data center in order to run your business? Yeah, in 2023, Maybe you pay somebody else to do it. And then you double down and focus on the things that you're really good at, which in this case, if we're an insurance company, is insurance, right? Now, here's the other cool thing about cloud. Two more things. One is that because you've got this API-driven infrastructure and they have figured out all of the installation, all the stand-up processes, they figured out most of the low-level operationalization. I know that's a big word. Let me say it again. They, they being AWS, Microsoft, and Google, have figured out most of the operationalization, meaning how do you operate MongoDB? How do you operate like a bus, like ActiveMQ, RabbitMQ? How do, that's a Q, obviously. But like, how do you operate those things? How do you operate these huge machine learning algorithms? 
How does that happen? Guess what? You can let them do that. And then what you can do and just say, look, I just want a MongoDB database. And by the way, I want it to scale across two loca locations geographically. Can you do that for me? And you just check a box and you're done. So this allows you, by the way, to get access to production-ready complex software platforms. Production-ready complex software platforms in like minutes. So you're no longer having to sit there and figure out, okay, hold on. I want to run this new social media server, let's say a Mastodon, right? But I want it to be globally available. How do I do that? I've got to put it in three locations. In, in Amazon, and Mastodon's not a good example because they don't have that figured out yet. But like all of your data stores, like your databases, like MSSQL or MySQL or MariaDB, all of that is a checkbox. You do a checkbox and guess what? You're running in two locations. A couple more checkboxes and you're running in a DR, like a disaster recovery, like a business continuity relationship meaning you've got a server, let's say in Ohio, and you've got another server in Oregon on the West Coast. Or if you're global, right, you've got one running in South Africa and you've got another one running in Mumbai. It's like, that's a checkbox in AWS. So this is another advantage of cloud is to have those kind of like access to those kind of capabilities. The other piece of that is that you can go global in minutes. Let's say all of a sudden you're running your website and you realize that there's users, like a lot of your user base is in Japan, but you, your presence is only in Europe or in Western Asia. You're not actually on the Eastern side of things. So you're like, oh, how do I fix that? In some cases, that's a checkbox. In some cases, you can redeploy your infrastructure to a new like, location, but like you could use like, for example, a content delivery network, which is basically a few clicks in most of the providers and take your website with a lot of its static content and make it globally available in minutes. So these are some of the advantages of using these cloud providers. Now, you've heard me wax on about this, right? Because it's like, it takes away infrastructure access. So you don't worry about failed hardware. Your personnel are less focused on the hardware and more focused on the software and the processes on top of it. It's all API driven. So you don't have to talk to somebody. You just do what you want. As long as you're willing to accept the payment terms, which in most cases are very reasonable, then you just like, you just do it. You just set up the things that you want to use and you just use the things you want to. And by the way, they do just have raw virtual machines. So if they don't have the service you're looking for and you just want to run it on your own virtual machine, you can do that. So like, for example, Mastodon, I don't think that AWS has a Mastodon setup. You could probably find it in their third-party marketplace, but you can just stand up your own set of servers and run Mastodon on a virtual machine. There's no issue there. So you're talking about increased reliability better security because AWS has 29 security certifications, way more than any business I've ever seen outside of a security focused business. Your operations team can focus on the things that really matter. Your business can be more agile and focus on the things that matter to them. And that all leads to overall increased focus. And remember your provisioning speed goes through. If you want to test a new idea, your provisioning speed is now faster minutes to get access, no longer weeks or days. So that's our peanut butter, right? So we got this whole cultural battle cry with our chocolate, and then we've got our peanut butter. It's, huh. So what happens when we take the chocolate of DevOps and the peanut butter of cloud, just for dramatic effect, what happens if we would have been together, right? That was just my little speaking unicorn, by the way. So what happens if we put these together? Now, here's the interesting thing. First of all, together, they all increase speed. They both increase agility. They both increase compliance, by the way. And when I say compliance, I mean security, adherence to company policies, right? So it's an improvement. And then they both enable automation because one wants automation, and the other one enables automation, right? And so you just see these incredible improvements. And the other thing is that a lot of times, both DevOps and cloud are focused on these guardrails, these systems. Because you will rise to the level of your capability, you will fail to the level of your systems. For example, it's really hard for most of us to get hacked from a banking perspective. Because if the bank has a system that says, if, if there's a bunch of weird transactions that start showing up on your bank, you get a little notification, right? It says, hey, these transactions happened in Germany, <laughs> right? You live in Hyderabad. Well, what? Did you suddenly teleport over to Germany? It's like, no, I didn't. And so 
that system prevents us from failing to a certain level. DevOps and cloud enable systems so that when we actually do fail, because we all fail, we all make mistakes, we all, and that happens, that we fail down to the level of our systems instead of beyond. And so a lot of times there's inherent guardrails, even for things like deleting data or exposing data to the internet. Do you know how hard it is to put data, for example, into an AWS S3 bucket and expose it to the internet? And yet you see people all the time getting busted for exposing private customer data out there across the internet using S3, which S3, by the way, is not the problem because S3 asks you like three or four times, excuse me, are you sure that you want to stick this data across the internet? And, and somebody had to say yes four times before your data got exposed to the internet. And so that's, of course, someone violating the guardrail that's in place. But my point being is that the guardrail's there. Like someone's intentionally saying yes to that before that data gets exposed. And so you will fail to the level of your systems. And that's true personally and professionally. So we want these cloud providers who have these great systems and this DevOps model, which has these great systems, we want them in place because they will limit the blast radius, if you will, the scope, the size of our failures. So let's talk about the stats. Because you probably saw this in the webinar and you were like, huh. What's Michael talking about? So one of the things to keep in mind is that if we just do DevOps alone, if we're just like, hey, you know what? Let's just follow that cultural battle cry. Let's put some people, some processes, some technology. Let's put some perspectives in place and let's remove any barriers that prevent the delivery of your software. And what's going to happen is that you're going to see a 52% increase average across performance, like software delivery performance in an organization. That's just DevOps on its own. So then, okay, now we got cloud on its own. So even if you don't do DevOps and you just move to cloud, your ability to deliver software increases by 53%, all very similar margins, right? Across the entire organization. For everybody who's using cloud, for example, and everybody who's using DevOps, obviously not the teams that are just sitting there, they don't get any benefit, right? So 50% increases are more, better than a coin toss if you actually use either one of these methodologies. You put them together and your performance for software delivery approaches 81%, right? If someone came to you and said, hey, Michael, I'd like to give you an 81% raise. I'd be like, oh yeah, no, that sounds great. 20% you know, sounds great. And that's not an ask, by the way. I'm just kidding. So it's like, in that way, it's like, who wouldn't want an 80% increase in uh, performance delivery? For example, let's say it was taking you two hours to deliver before and all of a sudden you see that time drop down to 25 minutes, 30 minutes. That's totally worth it. So just know that when you bring these two concepts together, when you create a cloud-centric DevOps process, a cloud-centric DevOps culture, a cloud-centric DevOps use of technology, which is important, you get an 81% gain. Now, so what are the major benefits, right? What are the major benefits of like munging these two together. First of all, cloud is already highly automated. How do we know? Because there's no way AWS, Microsoft, and Azure can operate the scale they're operating at unless everything's already automated. I'm going to say this, is that at last conversation with AWS, in just Virginia, they were running 1.75 million SQL databases. Let me say that again so you make sure you heard me. 1.75 million RDS databases, not Aurora, just straight up RDS in just Virginia. 1.75. Can you imagine being responsible for making sure that 1.75 million databases of varying sizes, I'm sure a bunch of them are non-production, so let's not get all excited about it, but let's say that only 50%, 25% are production. That's crazy. 1.75 million databases just in one data center. That doesn't even include all the other data centers for AWS, right? So they're already doing cloud-centric automation, but this now allows all the automation desires that exist inside of DevOps. You can now do them in cloud. Everything's API-driven. So the only limit is your skill ability to automate. Your only limitation is your ability, your skillfulness to be able to do that, automa that automation. That's it. That's the only limit. Then we move on and we've got this centralized platform. Now, some people are like, but Michael, I don't want to be locked into the vendor, right? And I get you, but I just want to say this is that multi-cloud is not really a thing, 
running different workloads on different cloud providers who are better at the other cloud providers is a thing, but you're not going to take the same workload and kick it across three cloud providers. First of all, the latency is going to be horrible. No one solved that problem yet, by the way. Can you imagine taking like the same application, dividing it into three parts and running it across Azure, Google, and AWS? No. First of all, you have to run independent databases. How are they going to sync? What's latency going to look like? There's going to be all these like concerns. So what people do is they take an app and they're like, you know what? This is going to run best in Azure. I'm going to use that. You know what? Google has the best developer experience, which they, they probably do, actually. I think I could argue that. So I'm going to run this app, which is more developer-centric over here on Google. And AWS has a, a broad swath of services that nobody else has. So I'm going to run this particular application, which needs those on AWS. So that's multi-cloud is identifying the right workload for your cloud. But regardless of that, you still want everything in a centralized platform. And it's really great, by the way, even if you decide to run workloads across all three providers, you've got three providers to learn. So most people start with one. So let's say it was Google and you just learn that first one. And then everything is centralized. Everything you do there works a certain way. And these are the guardrails that I'm talking about. There's only a certain way to attach storage. There's only a certain way to attach object storage. There's only a certain way to attach network storage. It's, it's a centralized platform and everything you need for that workload is in that platform. It's fully centralized there. The other thing is, I don't know how these guys do it. I really don't. And I've worked for AWS. And I've seen behind the curtain, right? Is that one point, let's go back to this 1.75 million databases inside of Virginia. What? Who provisions that hardware? They have figured out, by the way, the formula. They can tell, by the way, when customers are going to be requesting more and when they don't. And so they've got some, obviously, they've got great metrics because data is a big part of DevOps, right? And so this, these infrastructures are, as far as we're concerned, infinitely scalable. And I've always joked, I've been like, okay, AWS, if I ever win the lottery and I just have throwaway money, which I, I, maybe I still wouldn't do this, but they say you can throw as much data on S3 as you want. Really, AWS, really? Because you better hope I don't just have a spare million dollars laying around because I'm going to see how many exabytes, petabyte, you know, how many bytes I can throw on S3 to see if I can break that system. But oddly enough, we haven't found the upper limit for some of these things. And don't get me wrong, you might go out there and request like 2,000 machines and there'll be a little pause where like Azure will go, hey, give us just a second because we're enabling or standing up a new section or data center. But my God, we're standing up 2,000 machines. That's amazing, right? So this is like really highly scalable infrastructure. The other thing is that since we're now not working on the hard drives that failed at 3 a.m. last night, and we're no longer running into hardware boundaries where it's like, hey, I need five servers. I only have three. So we're no longer like letting other like operational concerns stop our ability to be agile. I know that many of you have been in that situation where someone says, hey, we'd like to do a proof of concept. We'd like to stand up 20 servers. And you're like, <laughs> 20 servers? What kind of data center do you think we're running? We don't have 20 servers just sitting around. And you're like, no, I just need 20 virtual machines. And you just, you keep chuckling. You're like, <laughs> I don't have, what kind of virtual machines do you want? One processor and 512 megs of RAM? It's, I can give you that. It's, you know, they're like, I want eight processors and 32 gigs of RAM. It's like, I don't have 20 of those. And so what happens is that things get a lot more agile because you're no longer responsible for the hardware boundaries. Let AWS and Microsoft and Google worry about that. Let them deal with that. And so you just focus on developing software and delivering value to your customers because that's what this end game is really all about. And then the other thing is that I got to tell you, like from my perspective, when AWS goes down, they go down hard. They take everybody with them, right? But remarkably, I'm shocked that they're not more down than they are, actually. Don't get me wrong. Every once in a while, you'll see like a very slight slowdown in one region or the next. But in terms of like globally going down, the cloud providers are remarkably good. You know, Azure had a bad year, I think, last year and the year before. But I mean, doesn't that just happen? As long as they're learning from it. The security vulnerabilities are sometimes a challenge for me to like swallow. But in terms of uptime and stability, these cloud providers have an amazing track record. They are far better than most data centers I've ever even heard of. So that's another benefit of cloud-based DevOps is that you don't have to worry about maintaining uptime and stuff like that. Now, here's a few key points. Now that we've talked about the peanut butter and chocolate of DevOps and we've talked about how they plunge together, here's a few things to keep in mind when you approach this. One, as I just mentioned about multi-cloud, 
make sure you choose the right cloud provider for your business, right? I will tell you that in 2023, probably most startups are going to start with Google. And then if you need more services, you're probably going to go to AWS. If you're a Windows shop and you're in that space, you're probably going to go to Azure. But don't get me wrong, Windows works great in the other providers. There's no issue there. But if you really want deep, like Microsoft level products, you're going to go to Azure, right? Azure seems to struggle the most with security, right? I and mean, that's just, at least that was the last year or two. Hopefully they're going to get better at that. And so that won't be less of an issue. Google, by the way, by hands down, has the best developer experience. And AWS has more services than all of them and widely varied. It's crazy. The other thing, though, is that when we're talking about DevOps, you, that's understanding like the provider and the technology. Make sure you understand the needs of your team. Like what technologies are they using? What processes are they using? And you got to stay flexible on this because it's going to evolve. They're going to start. It's like, it's like dealing with my 16-year-old son. But in the morning, he'll be like, hey, dad, I definitely would love pizza for dinner. And then he gets home and he's like, hey, dad, can we order some burritos? And I'm like, wait, I just didn't. We, I thought we, was, we were doing pizza. And then he'll come back an hour later and, you know what, I, I changed my mind and I want hamburgers. And I'm like, okay, look, pizza's already in the oven. And he'll eat it. But you got to stay flexible, right? It's like, you gotta, and you got to be just as kind and as flexible as you would if it was your 16-year-old son, right? You just have to like, well, we're going to adapt, right? We're going to change. So you want to make sure you get collaboration. You get consensus. That's a huge piece, by the way, of DevOps. And it's not all about being touchy-feely, right? Although that's helpful. But it's definitely about asking questions and communicating. And if you're not doing that, you're probably not doing DevOps. And so last but not least is that we talked about all this stuff and all of this is enabled by solving people problems with technology. In other words, you got to communicate, figure out what people need. And then you have to use technology to stand up these pipelines. You have to, sorry, you have to use technology to stand up cloud providers. You have to use technology to stand up these virtual machines and these buses. So you've got to build your skills because if there's one thing that you need to know, you might look up the number of virtual machines that AWS has. You might look up the services that GCP provides, but you're going to need to know how Terraform functions if you're using Terraform, or you're going to need to know how Ansible works if you're using that for server configuration. So just know that you do need to build your skills around the tools that you use, because if you don't know how to use your hammer and you're a carpenter and you don't know how to use your saw and you're a carpenter, it's not going to work. So just kind of keep that in mind. So this is where we landed with peanut butter and chocolate. Is that it's an 81% improvement across the board. Obviously, everything that we just talked about in terms of making the most of DevOps and all of this around cloud-centric automation, centralized platforms, excellent scalability, excellent agile development, and incredible uptime and stability. These are all benefits of taking that peanut butter and that chocolate, putting it together, putting the DevOps and putting the cloud. Good. Okay. So in the slides, there's some learning paths here about some of the points that I was talking about. We do have obviously a cloud learning path and a DevOps learning path. If you have any questions about this, you're like kind of curious as to like, where do I go next? Catch me on Slack or send me an email. It's Michael, M-I-C-H-A-E-L at codecloud.com. Okay. So that was a lot of talking on my part. I would love for there to be some at least written talking, if not verbal talking on your part. So any questions that you might have about this presentation or particularly any questions about AWS or in particular about certification or really just DevOps in general, I'm all open for. So the floor is now open for any questions that you might have. You say there's going to be some courses here released soon, actually. I don't see a question in the Q and A section. You would like to take. Yeah. So Daniel, you asked a great question. You said, I've "Been having some difficulty getting a solutions architect job in North America." Okay. So I've got an answer for this because I shepherd a lot of people into jobs. I actually was super proud. I actually just got a friend of mine who was a massage therapist. And she wanted to get into technology because she actually had a, I know it's going to sound weird. She had an engineering degree from a major like tech university, but she hated it. And so she came back to me and said, how do I get into this cloud game? And so she actually just landed a job as a solutions architect. And so the number one thing I told her is to create a portfolio, go on GitHub, do 
all these projects, do the projects, go read the documentation. You know how they have those tutorials in there and they're like, create a code pipeline or stand up a virtual machine using Terraform or even this, all the stuff that we do in code cloud. Imagine if you took all of that and you made a, a GitHub repository that contained all of your diagrams, all of your code for everything that you've written. If you're not in the habit of this, by the way, I would totally recommend that everything that you write in code, whether it's a YAML file or an actual programmatic code or a shell script, put it in a showcase repository, polish it up, put comments in there, make it pretty. And then that way, when people are like, hi, what can you do as an architect? And you're like, let me show you this design that I worked on, which shows you creating, for example, a completely serverless repository where you put a video file into S3 and it transforms into a higher resolution video file, or like lower resolution or like mobile versus desktop. And you put the design in there. Now, by the way, you could have gotten this from a tutorial. You could have gone to workshops.aws. You could have gotten this off of our code cloud setup. You could have actually grabbed it from anywhere, but what you did is you took it, you made it pretty and you owned it and you put it into a portfolio, preferably like GitHub or GitLab or some variation thereof. And then that way people can see proof of your work. It's not enough to say that you've done something today in 2023. And don't get me wrong, the certifications are very useful. Certifications are extremely useful, but certifications alone will not get you there. What you need is you need maybe certifications, but more importantly, a portfolio that will prove that you have done the work and that you can answer questions about it. Remember, if you meet Elon Musk, here's the question he's going to ask you every time. What is the most important or significant technical problem that you've solved? And if you do not get into the details with him, you will not get hired. And I actually think that while that's a high bar, the ability to talk in detail about how you solve problems is what people are looking for in architects and what they're looking for in engineers. So when you have proof in a repository of your work, then that's what people absolutely love. So more than a great resume, right? More than great certifications, show them that you have done good work by putting it into a repo and showing them what you did, right? And I would say, get very focused. Don't claim, for example, that you can work on an Ansible chef and puppet, pick one. Don't claim, by the way, that you can do Jenkins and you can do GitLab and whatever. Show them one, pick the one that's your favorite. Because by the way, we can all agree that if you can master Jenkins, you probably know how build processes work. So you can work with Travis CI and Circle CI. We know you can figure it out. But what we want to know is, have you taken the time to actually do it with at least one tool? Because if you're really good with a tool, then you could probably learn another tool of a similar nature. If you know how to use a hammer, you can use a claw hammer. It's not like it's a big change. You just It's a different way. That's all. Good question, by the way, Daniel. Let's see. I'm going to answer one more Q&A question, then I'll switch over to some of the things I see popping in the chat. Let's see. Worked as a cloud engineer for seven years. How should I move forward in today's age? Ah, they killed. Good. So if you're an AWS cloud engineer, what I would say is, one, can you fully orchestrate your application environment end to end? Like how DevOps are you with cloud? In other words, can you, if that whole thing was deleted, let's say your entire application infrastructure was deleted in AWS, which by the way, that happened to me in 2013. Someone ran a report, a Ruby script, and it said lists. And what it actually did is it deleted the entire non-production environment, including all the backups. We had that thing stood back up, by the way, in 50 minutes, 50. Now the database took a little bit longer than that because it was terabytes in size. But that's what you want to get him to kill is like, how much are you out of the way as an AWS? Can you stand up an entire end-to-end -end development pipeline from repo to production automatically using either CloudFormation or preferably Terraform, just to say this. Maybe some Ansible thrown in there, maybe some Packer if you need to do some image management. But how automated, Nikhil, are you able? How, what is your ability to completely automate the standup of that platform that you're working on? That's probably what I would focus on in this day and age. After that, let's say you get really good at that, then take a look at the concept of platform engineering. Platform engineering is the concept of taking something slick and smooth like cloud and making it so it's really consumable for developers. Remember what I said before, if you take a problem and you make it really easy to solve, that product will sell. 
whatever problem you're solving, whatever product solves that problem, if that product is incredibly easy to use, has no friction, right? Like people can pick it up, use it, and it solves their problem. Boom. Doesn't even matter if the problem's simple. Doesn't matter if the problem's complex. That's why I'm advocating that you you look at platform engineering after that automation because platform engineering says, what is the easiest thing we can do for developers to deploy? What does that look like? So I would look at that. So start with automation for your cloud platform, get really good at automation, and then look at platform engineering. That helps. Let's see, Mashud, road path of DevOps for beginners. Okay, so in this slide deck, you may have seen before, <laughs> excuse me, a DevOps learning path. I'm going to click on this and just load it up for you, right? So this is the basic DevOps learning path inside of CodeCloud. And I would highly recommend you take a look at this because this is going to cover shell scripting, Gips, lear learning labs, concepts around 12-factor apps, which oddly enough is 2005 and yet still incredibly re 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 relevant. Remember that the Agile Manifesto was written in 2001 and we still haven't mastered that either. So just know that even though it's older, we still haven't figured these things out. Then you go to Docker training, a little bit of Go, some Jenkins. It's a lot here, right? But this is the beginner section, right? It's just learn these beginner pieces because if you don't know operating systems, you don't know shell scripting basics, you don't know Git repositories, that's probably where you want to start because that's where everything starts, honestly. Okay. Sacha, why is Azure Cloud getting more popular in DevOps world these days than AWS Cloud? The reason is that I think AW, Microsoft is really great at wooing developers. And I have to say their Azure DevOps product, Satya, I think is pretty good. <laughs> it's really good. And Microsoft has always been better at the business side of things than say AWS or even Google, right? Google's a little bit like Apple. They don't even want to play necessarily in the business space. Like that, that's something they just like recently got into. And Amazon's kind of the same way is that they sell like a lot of like really great API access, but they're not really focused on how to string that in to like, a, like to solve business problems. They are, but they don't really have great frameworks for that. Microsoft's been doing that for 20 years, 30 years, right? So Microsoft's just a little bit more mature, and I think that's why it's getting a little bit more popular. I hope they fix their security issues, which I'm 100% sure they will. Um, but other than that, I would say that the cloud providers are all very comparable, right? There's pros and cons for all of them. So I wouldn't necessarily say just because Microsoft has some challenges that they're not great. They are gaining popularity. So I agree with that statement, Sacha. But that's why Microsoft has always been better at the business part. Let's see. New to cloud computing and currently getting solutions architect certification. Does it make sense for me to learn DevOps at the same time? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't do that. So, Belen, I'm going to give you very clear advice. If you're working on a particular topic, Stay focused on that topic. Do not dilute. If you're working on SAA, which by the way, takes typically 60 hours of study plus some practice exams to really get it, I would stay focused on that topic, learn the cloud, dive in, squeeze the juice out of that topic, and then go learn DevOps, right? So finish your solutions architecture piece first and then move over. Because remember, focus is the most important thing, right? So I want you to stay focused on that single topic, squeeze it out, get the certification, then move over to DevOps. Okay, Krishna, I saw your question, but I'm gonna come back because I'm gonna answer some questions that are in the chat. Let's see, after certification, we start job or any way we can choose. Shri, I'm not sure exactly what you're asking, so ask me another way. Satya, why is Azure Cloud getting more popular? Okay, you switched your question over. That was good. I think I answered that one. Abhishek, sometimes it's overdose of tools in a project. Da, 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 da. Why is GCP not picking up the pace? It's been so long. That's a good question, Abhishek. I didn't, like one, just to say this, if you're learning a tool, because I think Abhishek has a great point. If you're learning a tool, go as far with that tool as you need to. You don't necessarily need to master the tool end to end, but what's the most complex task you need to do? Then switch to another tool. And then by the way, figure out how the first tool you learned integrates with the second tool. So for example, when the question I got just now about, hey, let's look at the Solutions Architect Associate, and then let's look at DevOps. Once you finish Solutions Architect Associate, and then you go learn DevOps, Figure out how to put the two together. We just did that. We just did that with DevOps and cloud. So basically it's like how to figure out how those tools relate together. And then when you add a third tool, learn that tool and then go back and figure out how that tool relates to the first two tools. This is genius way to approach it. And I just learned this recently because it keeps things contextualized. Otherwise you're going to overdose 
on a lack of context for all the tools that you could learn. I don't think anybody who can hear my voice right now is sitting here going, I love how the technology space is getting smaller and there's really less but more important things to learn and there's only a few ways to do things. That's not the case. Now it seems like there's 50 ways to do the same thing. And so how do you pick the right way? The great thing is, is at least for DevOps engineering, the tools are really clear. Terraform is one of the clear tools. Ansible has emerged as a clear winner compared to Chef and Puppet, even though Chef and Puppet are cool, right? It's like Linux is ten, tends to be the predominant operating system, even though Windows has a, obviously a place. So I'm not knocking that. I love both of them. I have no bias against it. And so it's like, there are clear tools, especially in relation to the projects we're doing. So make sure you stay focused on one tool at a time and contextualize it. To go back to the previous question though, why is GCP not picking up the pace? I don't understand either. Google provides the best developer experience in the world and their platform needs work. That's all I have to say. And they do Kubernetes better than anybody. They do a bunch of things, but their, their big data stuff is like way better than other people's. But they're just not there. I don't know why. Do we need to have a company sponsor to get a security clearance? Should we get a security clearance? Yes, you need a company sponsor typically to get a security clearance. It's usually required just because there needs to be a subcontractor associated with the DOD. Should we get a security clearance? If you are given the opportunity to get a job to get security clearance, know two things. One, that can be very valuable. Two, just know that you will probably be slotted into jobs that require security clearances for the rest of your life, but it can be very valuable. I do a lot of work for Booz Allen Hamilton, or did actually, and almost all their stuff requires security clearance and it is worth it. Best way to start contributing on an open source project if you haven't done it before. Best way? write to the open source project and say, these are the things that I can do or I'm willing to do. And this is how many hours a week I can put in. How can I help? And by the way, most open source projects suffer from a glut of developers and not enough people who can do non-technical work like writing, advertising, marketing, spell check, like simple stuff. So even if you're not a great coder, just know that you just write to an open source project and say, look, I wanna contribute, here's my skills, Here's what I'm willing to do. Here's how much time I can put in. You will most likely get a response pretty quickly. Let's see. A couple months back. Oh, hold on. Here we go. This is a great question. Moonish. Oh, wait, there's another session. Hold on. Wow, I got a bunch of questions. So, Moonish, you said, how much time will it take to learn both and to value time learning while being patient while learning? Here's the deal. One of the things that can create patience in learning is that if you rush your learning and you don't actually learn the material, you're gonna go back and learn the material again. I know that there are people who can hear my voice on this call right now who have learned, for example, how to use, let's pick VI. <laughs> VI, the editor, that's the really popular on the command line. And you've probably went in and you've done the practice and you've learned how VI works because you know that you needed to learn how to do a text editor on the command line. And you learned all the ins and outs and you didn't practice it and you rushed it through and you were bored and you didn't really practice it. You didn't learn it. You didn't try it. You didn't apply it. And then three years later, you're like, I got to go back and relearn VI. And then another three years later, you're like, I got to go back and learn VI. So the reason you want to be patient while learning and you want to contextualize while learning is that if you don't do that, it's like reading a book, but you didn't remember anything. You're just wasting your time. Don't do that. Time and focus are the most important things that I cannot give back to you. If you give me money, I can probably give that money back to you, right? But if you give me your time and focus, I can't give that back to you. That is lost. So if you are going to commit to learning something, take the time, spend the focus, do the work, right? And that should create a sense of patience. Do not move on until you've gotten to the level of mastery that you need to. It's really important. I just want to check in. It's 11.31. Can we keep going or do we have to stop? Oh, and Tika. Oh, I haven't heard anything, so I'm going to keep going. How will ChatGPT AI help cloud DevOps engineering? Oh, I'm so sorry. I was on mute and I was oh, speaking. So sorry for that. Yeah, we can pick a few more questions, like maybe one or two, and oh. then we can close the session. That's okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So, do, do, do. Bulan, I think, was the next one. Or was it Krishna? Hi, everyone. Does getting cloud certifications help me get a DevOps job as well? No. 
I would say no. It can help, like they'll require you to know cloud infrastructure. Certification can help you, but for a DevOps job, they're really going to be looking like, do you understand the full end-to-end -end pipeline? Do you understand the tools that are required? Do you understand the steps of taking something from software, from repo all the way to production? Do you understand all those different phases? So it, it can assist, but honestly, if you're going for a de any kind of job where DevOps is key, cloud is considered an afterthought in 2023. Like they expect you to know cloud. I, I apologize. I hope that doesn't offend anybody. It's just kind of the way things are. Like they, they expect you to really have under, understand cloud at a base level. So unfortunately it doesn't. I would spend time understanding DevOps processes, DevOps patterns, DevOps tools, if you're looking for a DevOps job. Okay. One more question and then we'll stop. Let's see. How chat GPT AI will help a cloud DevOps engineer in future time? All right, so Satya, this is a great question. And I've been all over this like crazy, like looking at ChatGPT, how accurate is it? Does it do Terraform? Can I write code with it? And here's the funny thing. I think what's going to happen is that it's not going to be ChatGPT because right now ChatGPT's accuracy is probably 80%, 90%. Now that's cool because you can go and say, hey, ChatGPT, I want you to write a, a Terraform file and I want to launch two Amazon AWS EC2 instances in US East one and you can get all the details and, and it'll write a HashiCorp file for you. But here's the problem. Is that going to do best practice? Is it going to fit in with your workflow? How is it going to solve any kind of deadlocks on the, like all the things you run into when you use Terraform, like how is it going to solve all those problems? And so ChatGPT will give you the raw like bricks, but it won't let you necessarily build a house. But here's what's going to happen. Six months to a year, they're going to come out with an AI and that AI, all it's done is read every piece of documentation and technology tools, right? So there's going to be a DevOps AI. As a matter of fact, I was almost tempted to create one myself using an LLM. And what it does is it just goes out there and reads all the best practice articles about Kubernetes and about containerization and about AWS and GCP and all the other stuff. And it just reads the official docs. And then maybe I pick a few high quality people that are lionized in the industry, like Martin Fowler and others like Gene Kim, and I have it read their books, right? And it learns their concepts and internalizes all that. And so there's going to be a DevOps AI somewhere in the near future that comes out that's going to be 95, 99% accurate about answering your questions, right? So just know that's probably where it's headed. But right now, ChatGPT can help you to write code. It can help you to write Terraform. But you have to know what you're looking at because it's going to be 80 to 90% accurate, more like 80%. And so if you don't know where it's wrong, which by the way, you can usually find, if you don't know where it's wrong, then you're going to spend a lot of time chasing down where it's wrong. And I don't know if you know this, but debugging is very painful. So <laughs> I would say right now, 80% accuracy. Within the near future, 95, 99% accuracy. So that's where AI is going to take us from a DevOps perspective. There's a bunch of other really good questions. I encourage you to catch me on Slack. I'm on the, usually in the AWS like core section on the external Slack. So always you can always catch me there typically. And of course, it's michael at codecloud.com. So we're going to go ahead and pause. So I'm going to pass it back. But thank you so much for being here. It was a pleasure to answer your questions. Please ask me more questions. And if you want us to go in a certain direction with anything, always feel free to give us feedback as well. Okay. Thank you so much.